This is the first video in a series covering the theory behind x86 buffer overflows, how they work, and how they can be exploited. This video covers some of the basic prerequisite knowledge around x86 memory management, with a particular focus on the stack, including running through an example to get a good understanding of how memory is managed in a normal scenario. In later videos, we'll then use this knowledge to exploit buffer overflow vulnerabilities to execute arbitrary code. Before we get into the stack, let's take a quick look at CPU registers. So CPU registers are fast locations in memory for the CPU to interact with. In the x86 architecture, there are eight general purpose registers, six segment registers, one flag register, and the instruction pointer. In x86-64, there are eight additional general purpose registers. Taking a look at the general purpose registers to start with, these are used to support arithmetic, I.O., stream, and iterative operations. However, there are two that we particularly want to focus on here, being the stack pointer, which points to the top of the stack, and the stack base pointer, which points to the base of the stack. Don't worry, we'll cover what the stack actually is shortly, but for now, just be aware of the 32-bit naming for these registers, being ESP and EBP. Moving on to the other registers, we've got the flag register, either E flags on x86 or R flags on x86-64. These have a number of bits available that serve various purposes when set, such as indicating if the result of an arithmetic operation is negative, or to indicate if debugging is enabled. We've got the segment registers. So these registers point to specific memory segments that we'll touch on shortly. However, it's important to point out that x86-64 uses paging instead of segmentation so these registers no longer serve that purpose on modern systems. Finally, we've got the instruction pointer, the EIP on x86 or RIP on x86-64. This points to the address of the next instruction to be executed. So this is particularly interesting if we're able to control this in any way, so we may be able to control the flow of execution and maybe execute arbitrary code. Let's take a look now at how Linux program memory is structured what the various segments are and their purposes. Windows memory is structured in a similar manner. At the top here, we're starting with the lowest memory addresses with the text segment, which contains the binary image of the process that's currently running. Next, we've got the data segment. So this contains statically allocated global variables that have been declared and initialized by assigning a value. Then we've got the BSS or block starting symbol segment. This contains statically allocated global variables that have been declared, but not yet initialized by assigning a value. Next one down is the heap. So this contains dynamically allocated variables. Then we've got the memory mapping segment, which contains file mapping such as shared libraries. Below this, we've got the stack. Each thread has its own stack, which contains local variables and parameters. We're going to focus more on the stack in a moment. Below the stack is the kernel space. This is reserved for kernel functionality and is not accessible from the user space that all of the above operates within. Now, moving back to the stack, let's see how it's structured. You'll see here that the stack comprises of stack frames, each of which correspond to an unterminated procedure or function. The stack works on a last in, first out basis, whereby the last item added to the stack is the first removed. In this example, if we wanted to remove frame 2, we would first need to remove the frames above. It's also worth noting that the stack grows upwards to lower address spaces. Let's look at a more detailed breakdown of the stack and stack frames. Here we can see the same three stack frames, the top being for the current function or procedure, and the frames below corresponding to the parent functions or procedures. Within the frames themselves, there are four main types of data we can see. Firstly, we've got the variables that get declared within the function or procedure. Below this, we can see the stack base pointer that gets stored when the frame is added. Below the stored EBP, we have the return address. This address gets popped into the instruction pointer or EIP once the function or procedure completes. As we know, the EIP points to the address containing the next instruction to execute, and so this return address essentially directs the code execution on function completion. And finally, below the return address, we can see any parameters that the function or procedure has been called with. The ESP points to the top of the stack, 
and the EBP points to the base of the stack. This allows for parameters and variables to be referenced as an offset from the EBP address. If we call a function from within our current function, its frame will be pushed onto the top of the stack with the current EBP included. This means that when the function completes, the EBP can then be restored. The EBP and ESP are updated for the new frame. Let's take a look at an example to get a better understanding of what's going on. Here's a simple piece of C code containing three procedures, main, sub1 proc, and sub2 proc. In the main function, we simply declare a local variable with a value of hello, and then call sub1 proc with world as the only parameter. Within sub1 proc, we declare a local variable with a value of how, before calling sub2 proc with r as the only parameter. Finally, within sub2 proc, we declare a variable with a value of u. On the right hand side we can see a debugger, which is attached to a process running a compiled version of this code, with the stack visible at the bottom, and the CPU registers at the top. Starting off the code execution, we enter the main function, and so we can see the return address and EBP have been written to the stack. In this instance, as it's our application entry point, the stored EBP is 0000000000. 000 000 000 000 000 000 000. Continuing through execution, we can see that our variable with a value of hello has been pushed onto the top of the stack. Next, sub1 proc is called with world as a parameter, and so we can see a reference to the address containing world being pushed onto the stack, along with the return address and save DBP as expected. Next, we declare a variable with a value of how, and so this is also pushed onto the stack. After this, we call sub2 proc with R as our only parameter. Note that the debugger hasn't automatically decoded this parameter, but if we check out the reference memory address, we can see that it contains 61, 72, 65, which is the hex for the letters A, R, and E. Above this, we can see that the return address and EBP are also pushed onto the stack. Finally, within this procedure, we declare a variable with the value of U, and so can also see this pushed onto the stack. Now that that's completed, this procedure will end and return as there is nothing left for it to do, and so its frame will be popped off the stack with the saved EBP being restored. The return address gets popped into the EIP as previously mentioned, and thus directs the next instruction. Once that frame's popped off the stack, we're back into sub1 proc, which also has nothing remaining to do, and so ends. We can see the frame being popped off the stack, with the save DBP being restored, and the return address being popped to the EIP. We're now back in main, which completes exactly the same process as its child procedures, and our program exits. In this video, we've covered some of the fundamentals of memory management in x86 systems, with a particular focus on the stack to understand how local variables and parameters are stored. In the next video, We'll take a look at another example, but this time, one that we can exploit a simple stack-based buffer overflow vulnerability to achieve arbitrary code execution. Thanks for watching.